hello everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Vilgus. I am a, a software engineer at Google and I am very, very happy to be here. I always wanted to visit Egypt, see the pyramids, uh, the Sphinx, the Nile. And this country is also the home for animals that always put a big smile on my face. Camels. Uh, in uh, the past, camels played a very important role you know, in this region, in agriculture, in milk production, and of course in the transportation industry. And when I close uh, uh, my eyes and think about camels, I see this. Camel train that transport goods uh, throughout the desert. The camels are really good pack animals. According to some sources, they can carry up to 300 kilograms, which is pretty impressive. However, camels alone are not particularly useful if you want to transport something less handy like a fridge. They are also not particularly fast and require a lot of maintenance. So, over time, camels and caravans were replaced with boat ships that can carry much more and are much more efficient. And efficiency, understood as the combination of speed, convenience, is the key factor in the transport. If you take a look at the current long-range transportation industry, it's dominated uh, by containers. To operate at global scale, big companies need to have a standardized ways of packaging the stuff. Like these containers on the picture, they come in well-defined sizes and can be easily stuck together. The content of one container doesn't interfere with the content of the other. The containers allow to utilize ships in a great way. The ship can carry more, they can be faster loaded and unloaded, and the containers are convenient for both the transportation company as well as the container provider. However, to make the best use of the containers, you need a proper infrastructure, like the cranes on the picture, uh, which are specially designed to load and unload uh, the ships in a fast way. You need trained operators to properly balance the ship so that the fully loaded ship doesn't turn upside down. You need uh, well-designed ships with appropriate cargo bays and sometimes electrical wiring to connect containers to electricity if needed, and so on and so on. You may ask why I'm uh, talking about ships and cranes. Uh, uh, well, uh, if you think about it, there is a large number of similarities between the cargo and the software development world. You, engineers, same as the cargo companies, want efficient solution. You also want your stuff loaded as fast as possible, packed as efficiently as possible, easily shipped, and delivered to the end user without major interventions. Often, possibly every day, or every green commit on GitHub. And for that purpose, software containers were created. Uh, how many of you have actually used the Docker uh, or other software containers? Please raise your hand. OK? Quite a few, but for, the, for those who didn't, there is a short explanation of what they are all about. Probably all of you are familiar with a concept of a virtual machine. A virtual machine is a package containing an operating system uh, plus uh, application with all of uh, their uh, dependencies running under a supervisor inside other operating system. They provide isolation. The content of one virtual machine doesn't interfere with the host machine or with other virtual machines that are running on the same physical boxes. They offer packaging, so you can take one virtual machine from one real machine and run it on some other real machine. However, they have a couple of drawbacks. In the server world, quite often, we have Linux, both inside and outside uh, the virtual machine. Actually, more than one Linux. In many cases, this is the same type of kernel offering the same system calls. So, if you could possibly remove that layer of Linuxes over there, you would save a lot of resources while keeping uh, a decent degree of isolation. And if you do it, we get uh, stuff like this. So, software containers, well-isolated applications with all of their dependencies running on a single machine inside of a single operating system. To make things a little bit more concrete, you can imagine that the application is your web page written in Ruby, and the dependencies for it is the Ruby runtime environment with all of the required gems packaged into a single bundle that is easy to run. At Google, we noticed uh, the benefits of uh, software containers long time ago. In fact, we have been using them for the last 16 years. Everything, everything runs in a container. YouTube, Search, Gmail, Maps. 
And we realized that having only containers doesn't work if you have hundreds of thousands of machines and millions of containers. You simply cannot log in to every machine and start the container manually. You cannot uh, go from one machine to another and check whether the containers are still up and running. And obviously, no human would be able to plan where to put this vast amount of uh, containers on uh, millions of machines to uh, have high utilizations. So we uh, built an internal system called Borg. Borg is great. It solves all of the mentioned problems. It handles thousands of machines and containers from multiple users running in a single cluster. But on the other hand, it is so complex and so tightly fitted to the way Google operates that it's impossible to run it outside of the company. After these 16 years, we believe that containers are great and that everyone should use them uh, and use them efficiently. So, with a couple of our partners like Red Hat and CoreOS, we created Kubernetes and we launched the first version in July 2015. Kubernetes is a system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized application. It's 100% open source, so everyone can use it for free. In fact, we open source it to such a degree that neither Google, nor Red Hat, nor any other company owns the code. With the release of 1.0, we donated all of its source code to a newly created Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So no individual company can control it or dictate the roadmap. It's a joint effort, and we really mean so. We run about 25 uh, special interest group every week to make sure that all voices in the community are well heard and taken into account. Kubernetes can run on cloud and on-premise. It focuses on applications, not machines. It does a lot of things automatically, and in the moment I will try to explain what uh, does it exactly mean. Usually, the best idea to explain topics is to use an example. So let's build a new site. It will be a web page with some text, lots of pictures, and possibly discussion boards under the articles. For the purpose of this talk, I will make the architecture quite simplified. We'll have a bunch of front ends uh, uh, showing the uh, web pages to the users. We'll have backends performing some kind of business logic. We'll have another set of web servers to provide images. We'll have a database uh, to store news and to discussion boards, and in the end we'll have an L7 load balancer on top of it. So on diagram it looks more or less like this. The requests come to load balancers and they are either routed to fronter or to backend. Frontend talks to backend and backend uses the database. How Kubernetes helps with implementing such an architecture? Let's start with a pod. The basic concept of Kubernetes. A pod is a set of containers that are run together on a single machine, share volumes, IP address, and can communicate easily via localhost. What does it exactly mean? Why pods are better than solo containers? In our new sites, we have a server that provides these celebrity images to the end user. One of many possible solutions contains two elements. Uh, the first one is some kind of component that pulls the images of, this is probably Ammer, uh, uh, from some central repository and stores them locally in a shared directory. And the web server that takes this image, these images from local directory and uh, send them to the end users. None of these components make sense without the other. You may put everything in a single container, but the separation of concerns usually leads to a better architecture. One important thing to mention is the IP addresses. All pods, uh, pod containers are accessible within the cluster using the same pod unique IP addresses. It is provided automatically by the Kubernetes. You create a pod, it gets an IP address, like DHCP protocol, but for containers. With each pod having a unique IP address, you don't need to worry about machine ports anymore. You can have 20 pods listening on port 80 on the same machine without the problem. So, for example, if you want to talk to this middle pod, you just uh, talk to it by this address is 10.5.8.2. What else is in the pod? The main part is, of course, the list of containers, and each of them is specified by the image to execute and the exact command that needs to be there. You can specify the amount of memory and CPU so that the Kubernetes 
knows where to put uh, this pod. And volumes. Kubernetes can automatically attach uh, some network storage like NFS, iSCSI, Cloud Drive, or simply a local directory on your machine. On the pod level, you can also specify, again, uh, among any other things, on what type of machines you would like it to run. Should it be a big machine, small machine, maybe it needs to have some special capabilities like GPUs. Should it run to, uh, close to some other pods or anywhere but not on the same machines or other pods. For example, if you want to have free instances of your service for high availability, you probably don't want to put all three of them on the same machine. There is also a priority information. Not all pods are created equal. Some pods are more important than others, and if you, uh, by any chance, don't have enough space uh, in your cluster to run high priority uh, pods, Kubernetes will automatically preempt low priority stuff to make uh, space for them. Okay, so in Kubernetes we have pods, pods definitions. Where do they live? How do they get there? Kubernetes consists of a bunch of elements. In general, it follows the master worker architecture. On the master, there is a central component called API server that receives requests from uh, pod creation, deletes, uh, uh, updates, status changes, and many more. These requests may come from users as well as from the other system components. IPS, uh, API server stores its data in a highly consistent key value distributed database called ETCD. That is the source of truth of what should be run in the cluster. There is scheduler that tries to find the best node for a newly created pods and nodes that have an agent called kubelet waiting for scheduler decisions. Kubelet is responsible for starting uh, and stopping containers on the machines when needed. Moreover, there is a set of controllers. And these controllers allow Kubernetes to work in a declarative way. Based on user-provided API objects, I will explain in a moment. The controllers are trying to execute some actions to move the current state towards the state desired by the user. Let's take a look at this example. Here we have a silly container whose only task is to keep the rectangle green. In our case, unfortunately, currently it's red. So the controller executes some actions and the rectangle becomes yellow. In the next iteration, the controller again compares the current state with the desired state, executes some actions, and it brings the rectangle more towards green color. And in the next iteration, we finally end up with uh, the green color as desired. In Kubernetes, we have a small army of these controllers that you, so that the user can focus more on what they want to achieve. For example, keep the rectangle green or pink instead of what individual steps needs to be taken to get there. These are the implementation details and should not be uh, too important. Let's see uh, some real examples of the controllers. Replica set controllers make sure that there is always the desired number of pod instances up and running. For example, you may want to have five replicas of these AMR images serving pods in the cluster. One of the, if one of the nodes that is running the replica dies because of high traffic or due to hardware failure or for some other reasons, Kubernetes will automatically restart this pod on some other node. The same uh, applies to backend and frontend. We want to have at least a couple of pods for high availability and because we expect that our service will be quite popular and a single pod may not be able to uh, handle all of the traffic. Oftentimes, you have to update the version of your software. With continuous delivery, you basically do it all the time. Usually, you don't want to update everything at once, but slowly roll out the change. And if something goes bad, you would uh, like to have a way to quickly roll back uh, to the previous version. In Kubernetes, this is handled by deployment controller. And deployment is built on the previously described replica set. Okay, so we have a couple of frontends, a couple of backends, each of them with kind of random IP address. How to configure the all of these pods to talk to each other. Kubernetes has the answer, services. In our example, uh, 
Kubernetes with the help of uh, object services can create yet another IP address that is automatically round robin across all of the backends so that uh, um, frontends can use this IP address to talk uh, to backends and it will be automatically, uh, the traffic will be automatically sent to one of the pods. To make things easier, uh, Kubernetes registered this IP address inside of in-cluster DNS service so you can use a convenient name service instead of just numbers. In our new site, we'll have four services grouping frontends, backends, image service, and the database. Behind the scenes, services work on a very smart uh, trick. The IP uh, of a service is automatically changed by a specially prepared IP table rules to the IP of uh, the buckets. Kubernetes runs a small agent called kubeproxy on each of the nodes to make sure that these IP tables are always up to date. And the Kubernetes users get round robin load balancing for free for their services. What about the outside world? How to translate HTTP requests to the services? Ingress object and obviously its controller will make sure that your L7 load balancer, should it be Nginx or maybe Google Cloud load balancers, knows where to uh, forward the request for images or for web pages. Okay, so here is how uh, the whole thing looks in Kubernetes. We have an ingress. Uh, that configures load balancer, and load balancer rows the traffic to services, both front-end images, uh, both front-end and the image uh, uh, just are served by multiple pods. Front-ends talk to the back-end via service, and back-end talks to the database also via service. So what does Kubernetes and containers give you from the DevOps perspective? Thanks to the packaging stuff into containers, you can uh, run your services basically anywhere. Kubernetes will make sure that this anywhere is right and meets all of your needs that is expressed in pod definition. Kubernetes handles all of the architecture for your site, the number of pod replicas, uh, the connections between uh, the various pods. So it's quite easy to build uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery uh, pipelines on top of Kubernetes. Kubernetes allows you also to specify health and readiness probes for your uh, deployment so your stuff is always in a good shape and restarted if, if needed. Or to specify auto-scaling so that the application and infrastructure adjust to the current traffic. So engineers can spend more uh, time on dev and less on ops. We learned about pods, deployment services. We built our site using Kubernetes abstraction but the story doesn't end here. Kubernetes is only the foundation on top of which other products are built. Okay, quite often you need a lot of, to do a lot of networking in your services like SSL termination, authentication, rate limiting, maybe circuit breaking. You can use dedicated library, you can code this stuff by yourself. However, you cannot do it for legacy software. And here comes Istio, another fully open source uh, project developed in Kubernetes neighborhood that has the answer to this problem. You remember this model which I showed you a moment ago, so the IP address that was translated uh, by uh, IP tables to the address of the exact pod? So Kubernetes, uh, Istio expands it. It's at an extra container with Envoy proxy to each of the pods and a little bit of IP tables magic to push communication through this Envoy proxy. And thanks to the trick, uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff. Istria provides you with management systems where you can configure the details of your networking for the entire site without changing any single line in your front-end or back-end code. So you can use the existing binaries, existing applications. And uh, it provides you a lot of things, authorization, rate limiting, policy enforcement, load balancing, TLS uh, termination, circle breakers, health checks, you can do stage rollouts, so only roll a percentage of your traffic to a new version of your application, you can do fault injections, and it also gives you a lot of rich metrics. And on top of Eastern Kubernetes, another open source community is building yet another serverless platform with all of the goodies from Kubernetes and Istio that can be put into life with just a couple of lines of configuration. 
And the world doesn't end on serving workloads. There is another open source project to use Kubernetes mechanics uh, to help with batch and machine learning processing cube, uh, called Kubeflow. And there are many more of them. Actually, some time ago I heard that there is about more than uh, 2,500 projects built based on Kubernetes. And speaking about numbers, uh, about uh, 1,800 uh, people contributed, uh, 70,000 commits to the core Kubernetes repository, and many more to the side projects. Kubernetes is offered uh, by virtually all cloud providers. Lots of vendors provide help with setting it on on prem, and lots of companies use them in production. Here is a fraction of them uh, who put their testimonials on the Kubernetes web page. But there is a lot of more of them. They just don't brag about it too much. So where is it heading? As Kubernetes is getting more and more traction, I believe that we are heading towards the world where the computational infrastructure is standardized, hidden behind the API, and works kind of like electricity. You take it for granted, and you don't think about it too much. The world that server-side applications are described in a standardized ways and can be easily run anywhere. The world where uh, lots of comp operational complexity is handled automatically for you, where you just say what should be the desired state and you don't care about the details. The world when you can focus on what is really important. Thank you. So if you want to find uh, more information about Kubernetes, please visit kubernetes.io. We have all of the source code in, on GitHub, and there is a very vibrant Kubernetes community on Slack. And if you have any questions, please catch me in the lobby afterwards. Thank you.